thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I want to start by talking about something that happened in 1771, which was the year that a French physician, um, I've got maybe a picture of him, Joseph Pierre Bouchot, published an encyclopedia of edible plants, which ran from apricots to serumbeth, which is turmeric, and the work classified hundreds of foodstuffs from around the globe on the basis of each plant's origins, its mode of consumption, nutritive qualities, and overall healthfulness. So asparagus, for example, was healthy but not very nourishing. Sweet potatoes were both extremely nourishing and an excellent food. So notice these words, nourishing. In the same years, an English shopkeeper recorded in his diary that a vegetable soup that he had prepared following a recipe scissored out of a local paper provided what he called a very good, palatable, cheap, nourishing diet. Two decades later, a Scottish chemist informed the British Board of Agriculture that he had discovered, quote, the art of making flour from potatoes from which a bread can be made cheaper than from wheat and as nourishing. What did these writers mean when they described a food as nourishing? According to 18th century dictionaries, Nourishing foods repaired and sustained the body, but there was agreement neither about the physiological processes whereby this happened, nor about any sure way of identifying the most nourishing foods. In fact, over a century would pass before scientists elaborated a nutritional paradigm that enjoyed any sort of scientific hegemony. But the word appears constantly in 18th century discussions of food. So what I want to try to do today is to talk about these 18th century efforts to define the nature of nourishment. I want to try to explore the struggle to identify the most nourishing foods, to characterize them, and I want to try to explain why this mattered to 18th century statesmen and other people concerned with the wealth and power of nations. I'm also going to consider a bit the nutritional opinions of ordinary people, of non-scientists, whose own assessment of a food's nutritive potential, combined with the views of learned scientists in an uneasy and very unequal dialogue. And although this is really a pan-European story, which is why I kind of wanted to start by nodding vaguely in the direction of France, I'm going to use Britain as a case study, just so this doesn't go on for, for, you know, a million years. But I want to start by talking a little bit about the population and the connections between populations and nourishing foods in the 18th century. So I want to do a little bit of setting the scene for this because 18th century savants were constantly trying to work out how much food an individual and a nation required. This was con- it was constantly commented on that as you know as one French bureaucrat, um, the mathematician Jean Louis Lagrange put it, the true measure of the poverty or wealth of a state was its ability to nourish the population. These things were seen as closely linked. So philosophers, economists, officials, and other members of the Republic of Letters engaged in a prolonged discussion over the 18th century about the relationship between the sorts of people inhabiting a territory and its wealth and strength and prowess. Interlocutors considered whether a large population was a fundamental motor driving mercantile and commercial success, whether a growing population in itself demonstrated that the polity was well governed, whether it was ever possible for a population to become too large for a territory. And these were all topics of ongoing discussion. But what everybody agreed about was that whatever its size, a nation's population needed to be healthy and energetic. Right? And this was, I mean, this was something that was common. You know, people would say, when people say that the wealth of the state consists of a large population, they mean a large, healthy population of energetic people, right? I mean, this was, you know, that sort of went, well, didn't go without saying because people said it. And as Michel Foucault argued decades ago, these population debates, as, as he called them, signaled the emergence of a new understanding about the exercise of power and about the relationship between statecraft and aligning the state's policies with 
the natural forces that were increasingly thought to underlie the structuring of all aspects of the world, from the economy to rules of politics. So understanding and developing these sort of large impersonal forces was seen as being a crucial task of governance and an important way in which statesmen demonstrated their fitness to govern, not through benevolence or a, you know, a paternalistic concern for the well-being of the population per se, but of following sensible patterns that reflected the way in which the world operated, like it or not. And part of this involved developing a high-quality population. So developing a healthy, high-quality population was increasingly understood as a core task of governance. The collective prosperity of the political whole was thus dependent on the energy and the vitality of individuals whose health began, therefore, to inquire an unprecedented political importance. So the health and the energy levels of individual people was endowed with this really quite significant political relevance. And at the heart of this relationship between the wealth and security of nations and the vigor and productivity of the population was the body of the laborer. This was kind of at the nexus. This is where these two things intersected. The true, oh, hang on, here's some nourishing foods. Let's not worry about it. The true foundation of riches and power is the number of working poor, as many writers affirmed. So that an increase in the health and energy of workers in particular was therefore of direct relevance to the state. And that in turn required an ample supply of nourishing food. Poorly fed peasants would not engender vigorous and robust children, and poorly fed soldiers scarcely defended the nation against attack, as many writers at the time remarked. So the supply of nourishing foods was inherently linked to the productivity of labor, to the strength and security of the military, and therefore to national prosperity. So it's this association of food working bodies, and national strength that animated the vigorous 18th century pursuit of nourishing staples for working people. So this pursuit, the pursuit of nourishing staples for working people, wasn't just about preventing famine. It wasn't just a way of forestalling food riots. It wasn't just a way of responding to moments of crisis and shortage. Rather, Concern to build healthy populations, institutions and individuals across Europe sponsored investigations into promising new foodstuffs and promoted favorite items, such as, in fact, potatoes, the topic of my um, long, ongoing obsession. So many different foodstuffs, and I would say potatoes actually more than anything else in the 18th century, but that's another story, were being investigated and promoted by learned societies, patriotic organizations, kings, monarchs, etc., from, you know, from Stockholm to Madrid and, and back and forth. I'll just give you one little example. I mean, here's just one example of the link between nourishing foods, nutritive foods, and the laboring poor. But what advocates of these schemes inc- repeatedly stressed was that the foodstuffs they were promoting, here potatoes, or there potatoes, was not only that they were good for working people, but that they were nourishing. Okay, But how could one actually determine whether anything was nourishing? in the 18th century. So I've tried to set up why this was interesting to patriotic individuals, statesmen, etc., why they cared, but how did they? How would you do it? So this is what I would like to, to turn to talk about now. So the, the late 19th century invention of the calorie provided an ostensibly scientific measure for assessing a food's ability to nourish. Right. I mean, that's what calories did. They correlate the energy inputs with the work outputs that a food enables. The subsequent discovery, really in the, mostly in the early 20th century, the, of vitamins and other nutrients added nuance to learned understandings of nutrition, but didn't fundamentally alter the scientific consensus that food requirements could be captured numerically, right? that you could quantify them and express them numerically. 
I mean, there was little scientific agreement about exactly what constituted a balanced diet. There was, I mean, there still is some discussion about that. But with the emergence of the science of calories, etc., there was general agreement that quantifying food's nutritive um, qualities was scientifically possible and the key way of understanding whether a food was nourishing or not. Right? Now, 18th century chemistry had not yet attained this level of authority. It wasn't yet able to explicate in a hegemonic and compelling way how the human body worked. Learned writers disputed how bodies operated, and they disputed more specifically how digestion worked. And I, I won't go into detail about this. I mean, this is a topic that's very interesting in its own right. But very briefly, I will simply say that 18th century scientists were very interested in the digestive process, and they engaged in many experiments to try to understand what happened to food when it was eaten. But the results were inconclusive. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the, the short version of all of this research. So, I mean, despite some very imaginative experiments undertaken to explain digestion, and despite some truly heroic efforts at self-experimentation and some horrendous experiments involving live birds and, you know, pouches of food and a lot of vomiting, there was no consensus about what happened inside the human body when food was swallowed. Competing theories view digestion as a form of fermentation, as a form of cooking, as a process of grinding, whereby the stomach, you know, ground up food into tiny particles. And there was, I mean, there was no agreement about any of that. There was no agreement about whether the nutritive principle of food might lie in starch or in gluten or in something oily. I mean, you can see this here, right, with this oiliness. Or whether, you know, something called mucilage. They were, chemistry was getting very good at breaking things down into chemical components, but they couldn't work out which, if any, of those chemical components were the principle of nutrition, right? They were increasingly able to say, this food contains a great deal of starch. But what did that prove, right? So, I mean, there was, there, yeah, so this is a whole topic in its own right. But the, the, what, how does this link to what I'm trying to talk about? Because these efforts to construct frameworks for ranking the nutritive qualities of different foodstuffs, of which there were great numbers, were, of course, partly determined by the desire of physicians to identify the most suitable foodstuffs for wealthy clients. I mean, there was a certain focus on trying to work out, you know, what foods you know, a particular wealthy individual might best consume for their own well-being. But a much larger purpose animated these 18th century efforts to construct a sort of universal dietetic knowledge. And this was the effort to determine the optimal diets for different sorts of laboring bodies. So consideration of food's nourishing qualities was inherently connected to concerns about the diets of working people. So, I mean, this is, and you see, one sees this in the way in which discussions of nutritional science are framed. And, and, you know, and I think just, I mean, here we have a sort of very small example of how the chemical constituents a chemical analysis of a foodstuff, its nutritive qualities, and food for laboring people are inherently linked. Now, we can also see the difficulties in establishing any kind of measure of nutritiveness, as well as these close links between nourishment and feeding laborers, in the many 18th century discussions of poor soups or economical soups. So I want to talk a little bit about soup, okay? A sort of prehistory of the soup kitchen. Because from the 18th century, charitable associations in many different European countries established public soup kitchens aimed at providing starchy soups for the needy in response to recurrent crises in the availability of grain. Now, of course, soups had long been dished out to the needy by charities and religious organizations, etc. But the 18th century saw an absolute explosion, not simply in the you know, quantity of soup that was being purveyed to the poor, but of soup's presence in public discourse. So it wasn't simply that poor houses and orphanages were adding these soups to their menus, but newspapers were explaining to the home cook how to make these economical soups for distribution to the poor. 
People wrote into newspapers as well, reporting on their own experiments with making these soups. Patriotic individuals offered prizes and premiums for the laborer who could, for example, invent the most wholesome and nutritious soup, costing not more than five pence a gallon, etc., which he and his family themselves consumed. There were there was a public discourse about economical soup emerging in the 18th century. And the most famous soup of all was the one that was popularized by Benjamin Thompson, the U.S. advisor to Carl Theodore, the elector of Bavaria, or Count Rumford, as he was called after his ennoblement. Here you see him warming his backside in front of his patent stove, which um, was one of his many inventions. So Count Rumford was... It spearheaded a whole series of schemes to rationalize the Bavarian state's management of soldiers and paupers and other actual or potential working people. And as part of his larger effort to try to make Bavaria a more rational and effective state as regards its use of, of working bodies, he scrutinized the diet that was offered at the Munich poorhouse with a view to increasing its nutritive qualities and decreasing its cost. And he aimed to identify, as he put it, the cheapest, most savory, and most nourishing food that could be provided. And he determined, he worked out what this was, to his satisfaction. This was a soup consisting in primarily of potatoes with some barley, some salt, some vinegar, and some croutons. He insisted on the importance of croutons, but that's again another topic. And Thompson calculated in great detail the cost of preparing the soup, taking into account not just the cost of the ingredients, but also the cost of the firewood, the fact that his special stove made the, you know, the firewood um, requirements lower, the cost of the cook, etc. And all of this allowed him to demonstrate unequivocally that a serving of soup cost about a third of a penny. And so in this regard, we can say, we can recognize in his approach the increasing authority that was accorded quantification as a way of determining truth. So there's a great deal of work on the 18th century rise of quantification as a language of authority and power. And so you can see the fact that Rumford went to all this trouble, you know, printed a chart, etc., as part of this kind of 18th century um, right to quantify. But Thompson believed that his soup was not only extremely cheap and extremely tasty, he also believed it was immensely nourishing. And he explained that an appropriate serving size was about five ounces, which he said was quite sufficient to make a good meal for a strong, healthy person. But in striking contrast to his detailed calculation of cost, his statement about the food's nutritive qualities were supported by no figures or quantification whatsoever. Instead, his assertion that five ounces was an appropriate serving was based on, as he put it, long experience which demonstrated that this quantity was, as he put it, enough to satisfy the hunger of a grown person. In identical fashion, the promoter of another soup kitchen in the same years in London relied on information that he obtained from, as he put it, a poor, miserable family in order to prove to his satisfaction that a 20-ounce serving constituted a nutritive, palatable, and abundant meal. And he explained, I think maybe I put this on a little quote, he explained that this poor, miserable family had been told to make a good meal of his soup and then return the next day and inform him how much satisfied them. Right? So determining whether these soups were nourishing required information that was available only to the eater. And Thompson's calculations and this sort of um, this sort of calculation of the nutritive quality of food was widely reflected in the discussions of whether a food was nourishing. So if we look at Benjamin Thompson's comments, not just about his, his famous soup, which was a, indeed a sort of phenomenon of the 18th century, he also commented on the nutritive qualities of maize and rice, for example, in a way that employed a similar embodied science, if we can call it that. And drawing in part on his own upbringing in North America, where, where he had been born, um, Thompson believed that maize was, as he put it, the cheapest and most nourishing food known. And he said some people thought that rice was very nourishing, but 
um, as he put it, evidence proved in a very decisive and satisfactory manner that rice was less nourishing than maize. So what was this um, very decisive and satisfactory manner? Well, this decisive evidence derived from, as he explained, the details of people acquainted with the feeding of slaves in the American states in the West Indies. And these sources, he said, had informed him that when enslaved workers were given the option of eating either maize or rice, they invariably chose maize. And he explained this. Um, in the following terms. So for Thompson, again, we can see that the measure of nourishment ostensibly lay in the bodies of the eaters. That's where the most authoritative argument could be located, right? You could say the people who eat it say that that's the most nourishing food. And I repeat, this notion that the body of the eater revealed the nourishing qualities of the food was widely shared. It was precisely this model that Adam Smith, for example, employed in his own comparison of the nourishing qualities of oatmeal, wheat, and potatoes, something that he, in fact, devoted some pages to in The Wealth of Nations. And in the first volume of The Wealth of Nations, Smith noted that oatmeal bread was sometimes alleged to be a heartier food for laboring people than wheaten bread. But Smith was skeptical about this claim, because, he said, the common people in Scotland who are fed with oatmeal are in general neither so strong nor so handsome as the same rank of people in England who are fed on wheat and bread. They neither, oh, I wrote this one, a little quote, they neither work so well nor look so well. So, Smith was able to determine the nourishment derived from wheat and oats through a consideration of the appearance and the laboring power of their eaters. Right? And he employed a similar method in his own endorsement of potatoes, which he also thought were a splendid food. And he noted that in London, potatoes formed the principal food of coal heavers, porters, and prostitutes, who he described as the strongest men and the most beautiful women, perhaps, in, in Britain. And no food, he concluded, can afford a more decisive proof of its nourishing quantities. So potatoes were nourishing because the people who ate them were beautiful, strong, and energetic. Right? And similarly, when, when Frederick Eden, the author of a monumental late 18th century history of the English laboring classes, when he disputed Smith's evaluation of oatmeal bread, he did not resort to the language of science. Rather, he challenged Smith's assessment of the appearance of oatmeal eaters. So against Smith's claim that oatmeal eaters were neither so strong nor so handsome as wheat eaters, Eaton cited the very healthy appearance of those inhabitants of Lancashire who subsisted principally on oat bread. And indeed, as he put it in his opinion, Handsomer and more muscular men are not reared in any part of the British dominions than in those countries where an oatmeal diet is predominant. Right? And he referred specifically to the 33rd and Lancashire Regiment, which he said consisted largely of oatmeal eaters. They contained, as he put it, some of the finest looking soldiers in His <laughs> Majesty's service. Right? So by, by centering their analyses around the bodies of laboring men, whether they're coal heavers or members of the Lancashire Regiment, Eden and Smith made clear why they were interested in the nutritive qualities of food. These were not randomly chosen samples of, of you know, the population. Uh, Eden and Smith aimed fundamentally at identifying a way to create a healthy and productive population of workers and soldiers. So the bodies of such eaters naturally lay at the center of, of any discussion. They were, you know, it was that, there was the way that you would not talk about their bodies. They were the bodies you were interested in. And, and similarly, indeed, the connections between nutritive foods and the productive capacity of laboring people is, is equally clear in discussions that I hinted to a moment ago about the diet of the enslaved. So Thompson's insistence, or Rumford, or whatever we want to call him, Count Rumford's insistence that enslaved workers in the Americas themselves endorsed maize's nutritive qualities. This was absolutely typical. 
So Eden, for example, you know, Eden of the, the you know fine-looking soldiers, I mean, in his own evaluation of the nutritive qualities of maize, he also again cited the purported opinions of enslaved maize eaters themselves. So he claimed again that you know that enslaved workers have the notion that they would never be able to, uh, they would never have strength sufficient to undergo their daily toils, right? If fed on wheat and bread rather than maize. Now, this sort of use of the opinion of enslaved workers to demonstrate maize's nutritive qualities is clearly according some sort of importance to the dietary evaluations of the people actually eating the food whose nutritive qualities were under review. If enslaved workers were not considered to be qualified to assess the impact of maize on their ability to work, Eden would not have cited their supposed views as evidence. Right? Now, this is really striking, since as people like Simon Schaefer have reminded us, the status of a fact largely depends on the status of the reporter. Right? And in general, during this period, working people, such as the enslaved, were, as in fact, as Schaefer put it, scarcely considered capable of acting as authors of corporeal reports. This was not something that working people were generally considered to be qualified to do. So this unusual recourse to the supposed opinions of enslaved workers reflects, I think, the epistemological importance that embodied experience had in the evaluation of whether a food was nourishing. But my point is not that enslaved workers actually held those views, right? I mean, I'm not claiming that whatsoever. My, my point is that people like Eden believed their arguments were enhanced by a, a, alleging that such views were being held, right? They believed that these opinions strengthened their own arguments about whether foods were nourishing. So ultimately, in fact, 18th century savants were obliged to rely on the evidence of experience because they had no alternative. They had not elaborated a single widely accepted paradigm to explain a food's ability to nourish. And so the body of the eater was sort of simultaneously a site for the application of dietary knowledge you know, originating elsewhere, but also a source of dietary information that could not be obtained elsewhere. The working eater had this strange double importance in these d debates about nourishing foods. So I'd like to turn a little, you know, briefly now to say a little bit about the opinions of ordinary people as regards nourishment. So learned discussions of nutrition overlapped with the vernacular language of nourishment that was employed by these laborers whose whose eating habits you know, had suddenly become of such great importance to the state. And the epistemological importance that was ascribed to the embodied experience of eating, I think, made this inevitable. Right? And in fact, people like Eden themselves document the nutritional vocabulary of the recalcitrant poor who objected to you know, charity soups and barley and potato breads, etc. This is washy stuff that affords no nourishment, Eden, for example, records working people saying. So-called mixed breads containing not just white flour, but also oats or potatoes or rice or barley or rye or wholemeal flour were increasingly recommended to the working poor in Britain as a nourishing alternative to white bread during the, the hungry 1790s when repeated poor harvests and government policies and ongoing continent-wide, in fact, global war um, placed wheat supplies under particular strain. So there was a particular focus in the 1790s in Britain as in other parts of Europe as well on bread and on the constitution of bread. And indeed, precisely because of these shortages, in November 1795, no less than the Prime Minister William Pitt himself urged the nation to consume wholemeal mixed breads, which he assured MPs, as he put it, had by experience been found both pleasant and nutritious. Right? I mean, that's exactly the words we would expect to see. So there was the Prime Minister telling MPs what people, you know, people ought to have more wholemeal bread because it was more nutritious. 
Now, people like Eden um, and uh, Thompson and many others recorded the responses of working people to this nutritional advice. Because concepts of nourishment and of a food's ability to sustain not surprisingly inform the dietary practices of laborers. One would not be, you know, one would expect as much. And indeed, contemporary commentators wrote about this. So, for instance, writing into Arthur Young's Annals of Agriculture, an important periodical of the late um, 18th century, writing from the village of Crocombe in Somerset, James Bernard, for example, reported in 1795, a year of particularly widespread shortages, that, as he put it, um, that as the principal food of the poor is, as he put it, the whitest bread, they say as they eat little else but bread, they must have it of the most nourishing kind. And urban workers held similar views. Londoners, noted one baker, have a foolish idea of not being able to work with brown bread as well as with white. Um, so we can have you know, similar comments. Um, or that they... Work, the whole wheat bread did not go so far as the same way. So corporeal experience underpinned these evaluations as well, just as they did the, the evaluations of more learned writers such as Smith or Eden. Now, scholars have long recognized the importance of white bread for urban workers in 18th century Europe. There's a lot of scholarship on why urban workers in particular wanted to eat white bread. And there's a certain body of scholarship that argues that it was driven by the desire to emulate the eating practices of the wealthy. I think it had nothing to do with this. In fact, in the 1790s, the wealthy, like people like William Pitt, were telling them to eat whole grain bread, right? And, there was, you know, and they were complaining about the failure of emulation. Lots of members of the nobility were saying, I am serving nothing but whole wheat bread on my table. The poor will admire this and they will copy us. But, and then they said, oh, they're not. This is really irritating. So emulation didn't really seem to be terribly effective. In fact, I think working people viewed white bread as particularly nourishing. They, this was, I mean, this, they saw this the, this, the nourishing principle, to be something that was diluted if you added more bran and bulking agents to the bread. I mean, this seems to have partly been because of the laxative effects of brown bread. There was much discussion in the 18th century that coarse bread containing a great deal of bran was, as people put it, purgative and relaxing. It's well known, conceded a parliamentary committee, that brown bread promotes a digestion too quick in proportion to its nourishment. And so for this reason, the paupers who were, for instance, fed at the Lingfield Poorhouse in Surrey complained that wholemeal bread was, as they put it, utterly incompetent to support them under their daily labors and as productive of bowelly complaints to them and their children in particular. So English workers evidently regarded the production of copious bowel movements as evidence that their bodies was not extracting the maximum nourishment from the foodstuff, that it was passing through their bodies without helping to nourish them. And indeed, it was not solely the poor who disputed the nutritive qualities of whole grain breads. A number of more learned writers as well um, commented, and Eden recorded with some surprise, in fact, that many employers were no more enthusiastic about this new recommended whole grain dietary that the prime minister was preaching because they too doubted that whole grain breads were sufficiently nourishing as such as to allow their laborers to put in a productive day's work. Parliamentary committees were established to, you know, determine the nourishing qualities of white bread, and they quizzed bakers on, you know, what they thought, etc. But the results were, as you might predict, um, inconclusive. So, I mean, to pull this, this sort of together, the, the food crises of the 1790s, which were what were putting this particular focus on whole grain breads, just as a, you know, as a case study, I think they illustrate particularly clearly how 18th century concepts of of the sort of, well, I guess what I'm calling the political economy of nutrition, they necessarily combined the um, emergent science of digestion, practical efforts to assure the health of the laboring population, and the embodied nature of nutritional knowledge, which relied fundamentally on information that could only be obtained from the bodies of the eaters. 
into this very unstable and unsatisfying but but um, potent topic of discussion. The decade-long debate in the 1790s over feeding the poor drew on all of these ideas. And ultimately, assessing a food's nourishing qualities without taking into account the embodied experience of consumers produced a, a partial and unconvincing result for 18th century interlocutors. So on what basis then, on what epistemological basis could governments and individuals recommend that the poor overcome their objections to particular foodstuffs if the assessments made by the poor themselves inform the nutritional recommendations that underpinned elite dietary advice in the first place, right? I mean, the dietary opinions of the working poor remained obstinately central to the emergent science of nutrition during this period. Now, I mean, to be sure, this epistemological authority did not put bread on their tables, right? It, it, it did not resolve the question of hunger, but what it did do is it directed the attention of exasperated scientists and statesmen to what they called the fastidiousness of this class of people whose objections to charity soups and, and health breads could best be countered by the claim that other people did find these foods nourishing. It was sort of the best you could do. Great numbers of our fellow subjects eat their bread much coarser than the Londoners. Are they weaker? They are generally stronger, insisted one such promotional text. Maybe again, I put that on, on the slide. Right, that was probably the best that one could do. Well, I want to try to put, sort of moving towards a conclusion to put in, to sort of pull this into, you know, place this in a little bit of, of perspective. So, well into the 19th century. Scientists and public officials juggled the truth values of what they called science on the one hand and daily experience on the other in determining of food's energy values. As the decades passed into the 19th century, the conviction that the health and energy of the worker was a crucial element in the national calculus, this conviction only deepened as scholars such as Anson Rabenbach have noted in their own studies of 19th century nutritional science. The conviction that healthy workers were essential to the health of the body politic took on new features with the emergence of a scientific consensus about the basic elements of human nutrition. And the recognition, the 18th century recognition that consumers were in some way qualified to evaluate their own diets diminished over the 19th century with the scientific hegemony of the new language of calories and vitamins, which purported to capture in objective terms the nutritive qualities of food. So we can contrast these sorts of discussions about the opinions of enslaved workers with, for instance, an oft-repeated um, British school text from around 1900, which explained in its discussion of the nutritional value of grains that starch forms a large proportion of all these plants. And you remember how useful an article of food that is because it contains a great deal of carbon. Gluten is the name given to the nitrogenous parts of these plants. We need much more carbon than nitrogen to keep up the strength of our bodies. Try to remember that 5,000 grains of carbon are required for a man and 300 grains of nitrogen to be taken every day. Right? I mean, little room is left between these statistics and the compounds for the man's own assessment of the strength of his body. Now, historians such as Nick Calather have shown the powerful ability of this new language to justify large-scale programs of dietary intervention and also, as he's shown, to explain the inequalities that characterize the age of empire. He's written, many people have written interesting work about how calories allow you to, you know, justify the supposed inadequacies of colonized peoples. But a further effect, which scholars have also noted, was that this new language of nutritional science excised the notion that the individual was in any way qualified to assess the merits of their own eating habits. By the late 19th century, scientific thinking had almost completely delegitimized self-evaluation as a source of dietary knowledge. Eating was instead positioned as a scientific act, 
A healthy diet was one that provided optimal nutrition, and that was a concept that was firmly in the grasp of nutritional trained you know, scientists and other trained professionals. Scientists such as William Wilbur Atwater or Max Rubner insisted that neither the cost of a food nor its taste were any reflection of its nutritional properties. So selecting food on the basis of what you thought suited your own body was unlikely to result in a nutritionally sound diet. Indeed, a diet guided by gustatory pleasure was increasingly positioned as absolutely inimical to good health because it was likely to seduce the eater into the consumption of pleasant but nutritionally empty foodstuffs. So the opinions of eaters weren't simply irrelevant to determining whether a food was nourishing. They were a positive hindrance. What I've tried to describe here in this talk is the nutritional universe that was displaced by this late 19th century rise of economic chemistry and domestic science. During the 18th century, nutritional evidence said to derive from the bodies and opinions of laborers, enslaved peoples, and other working individuals formed an important part of learned arguments about a food's ability to nourish. Despite the immense authority accorded to quantification in the 18th century, and despite intensive investigation of food chemistry, 18th century scientists failed to establish an impersonal metric of nutritiveness. By the end of the 19th century, in contrast, nutrition had become a matter of scientific fact, not a form of embodied knowledge. I think it's tempting, as a sort of you know, final observation, I think it's tempting to suggest that this shift from embodied to, to chemical models of nutrition somehow parallels the shift that's been traced by writers, uh, scholars such as Mitchell Dean and others from an 18th century concern with managing the poor to a 19th century concern with poverty. The 18th century concern about the poor understood the poor and working people and the working poor as a vital component of governance, whereas the 19th century understanding of poverty positioned this as a social problem that could be understood through scientific measures. Poverty was a condition created by the irresponsible neglect of the impersonal economic forces that shaped human existence, right? This is the 19th century idea, that there impersonal laws that govern the economy and how it works, and you ignore them at your peril. If you do, you will fall into poverty. Poor nutrition by the 19th century was caused by a willful disregard of scientifically established dietary advice. And so from this perspective, the principles of economics were no more subject to you know, personal opinion or individual negotiation than were the carbon requirements of a fully grown man. The stability of this 19th century edifice of economic and nutritional truths has long been questioned, in fact, not least by dietitians and economists themselves. And I think it's perhaps instructive to remind ourselves of the somewhat different 18th century universe that those 19th century ideas displaced. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.